talk to you about miracle faith. Now, God desires for us to see miracle moving power in our lives, in our personal lives. And when we signed up for Christianity and we got in the Jesus line, we recognized that Jesus has power, that there's power in his name and that we have the ability, we see signs and wonders throughout the word of God and we hear about miracles with people around us and in this world, I was looking at a story, there was a story in 2013 in Dayton, Ohio on August 5th, there was a man and he was married and had a couple of older children. Maybe in his 40s, he didn't wake up that morning. And his wife freaked out and panicked, and she drove him to the hospital, and they pronounced him, him dead. He was dead for 45 minutes. He had been dead. And the young boy was 17 years old. His name was Lawrence, Lawrence Tolly. And he was standing outside the hospital room with his youth pastor. He was involved in his youth group, and they had been praying for dad. And it says that he went into the hospital room. He said, he said this on TV on Good Morning America. He said, I walked into the room. Something came up on the inside of me. And I looked at my dad and I said, dad, you're not going to die today. 45 minutes he had been dead. The doctor said they had never experienced or seen something like this in his whole career. Immediately, the heart monitor began to beep. His heart started beating. This man was on Good Morning America talking. He's fine, dead for 45 minutes, has no brain damage. His heart's working perfectly, totally healthy. Came back to life. And these kinds of stories are not actually that foreign. We hear them time to time. We serve a God of miracles. And if a 17-year-old boy can raise the dead, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. And God wants us to see miracles happening in our lives. Faith speaks. Everyone is speaking by faith. When Jesus walked this planet and he needed something to change, he spoke to it. Our faith speaks. And it's when he spoke that things changed. Amen? Yes. It's when he said, Lazarus, arise, that Lazarus arose. He's, his faith spoke. And when your faith in God speaks, it sounds different. We're all speaking by faith, but not all of us are speaking by the faith that comes from Jesus. Come on. Yes. When we say... I don't think I'll ever get out of debt. I want you to know that you are speaking by faith because you're saying what you actually believe. That's the problem. We're trying to change our confession. I better not say that. When what we need to be changing is our faith because your faith will speak. Sometimes what's coming out of your mouth, I don't think I'll ever get control of these kids. What came out of your mouth is what you actually believed. (laughs) And so the battle is to change what we believe. Miracles happen by faith. Now, we're going to look at Peter today and three miracles that Peter experienced in his life that he spoke by faith. And we're going to learn from Peter how we can get this kind of miracle working faith happening in our lives in a more consistent way. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for this morning. I ask, Lord, that you bless this time. And Lord, that your word would be food for us, that it would feed us and nourish us. And Lord, that your word would also be seed in our hearts, it would take root and change us in our lives and produce fruit in us. Holy Spirit, be our teacher this morning and teach us the things that we need to know. Prepare us for the things that are coming in our lives. And Holy Spirit, partner with me this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 1. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, is about three o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried 
whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. Now, what we're about to see is the very first miracle happening since Jesus was crucified. Now, the Holy Spirit has come, so that's a miracle. But I mean, a physical miracle, a healing, is the very first one we see in the book of Acts. Is the church has just been born. This is all new stuff. Jesus has ascended to heaven, and Peter and the apostles are kind of out there doing the thing. And so Peter and John are about to experience their very first documented, detailed miracle. This is number one for them. And Peter and John, are, the, the Holy Spirit just came. They just preached. 3,000 were saved, it says. And now this is the next story. Okay? So they're walking to get some prayer. How many know that you got to go? They, they were, it's a good thing to go pray. When you're going to pray, something good about to happen. Okay? Sometimes the, the bad stuff's happening because we weren't going to pray. <laughs> so they're going to pray, and they're going where? So they're going to God's house to pray. It's 3 in the afternoon. They walk in the easternmost gate, and they see a certain man who's been lame since birth. And they used to lay this guy at the gate called Beautiful where he would ask for alms. It says, verse 3, the man who was lame saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, and he asked for some money. And fixing his eyes on him, this is Peter, and he's with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from some money. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Listen to how he says this now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked, entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. A miracle just happened. And we got applaud like we were there and we just saw it because this really happened. And you're thinking, well, it's Peter, right? Now, who's Peter? Peter's the guy that Jesus passed the baton to when he left. Like, you're in charge now, man. Peter's the guy who helped pick the 12th disciple that would replace Judas. Peter's the guy that would bring the hard questions to. He was the leader. There was Peter, James, and John were the three, but Peter was the leader. Peter's the one that Jesus said, I'm going I'm to build my church on you, right? Jesus the chief cornerstone, but he said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I'm going to give you keys to the kingdom. This is that guy. Yes. So when, when Peter performed a miracle, you'd be like, well, it's Peter. I mean, come on. It's Peter. Of course he, he performed a miracle. But actually, this is, this, is, this is new. Peter doesn't normally talk like this. This is new for Peter. In fact, just about 50 days ago, he was hiding out in a room behind a locked door because he was scared of the Jews that were going to come. It wasn't that long ago that that was that Peter, that Peter went fishing right after Jesus resurrected. He went fishing with the guys, and Jesus had to come rope them back in and say, hey, I got something for you to do. I need you to love me more than fishing. Okay, so that wasn't that long ago, let's just be honest. In fact, it was, Peter's really in his fourth year with Christ. His fourth year. It wasn't that long ago that Peter didn't even know who Jesus was, Right? And, and so last week I talked to you about your, your four, your five, your six, and your seven. If you were here, if you weren't, grab it. He's, he's in his four, right? And so he's starting to see some fruit of what he started in his one. He's starting to see some fruit now on that olive tree. He speaks and sees a miracle, but this is new. In fact, John would have been like, go, Peter. Look at you, man. Made a little swat on the butt. Go, man. Look what you just did. Now, Peter, explain, everybody starts freaking, about, freaking out about what happened, and he begins to explain what happened or how it worked, because everybody wants to know when a healing happens, how'd you do it? And so he says this in verse 16. It's by faith, say faith. faith. It's by faith in the name of Jesus. Now, the name of Jesus is a title of authority, yeah. right? It's not just he's the Messiah, but he's been given the name that is above every name, and that name has been assigned to you. Somebody say amen. amen. We have been given that name by faith in Jesus. And so it's a title that says, 
Everything has to bow in the name of Jesus. That's the name that created it all. Everything that's been made, everything you see was made through Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. And so that's the title. Every, sickness has to bow. It, it cannot survive under the authority of Jesus. When it says, our God reigns, somebody say amen. amen. And so sickness, crippledness, these kinds of things, they, they have to bow. They have to obey the title that is Jesus. The name, faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see now was made strong. It is Jesus' name. And remember what Jesus said, ask for anything in my name. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him, somebody say amen, there's faith that comes through him, that has completely healed him, as you all can see. So Peter says, how did, people, how did it happen? They all ran to him. They're like, what'd you do? He said, and he even said in verse 12, he's like, why are you looking at me like it's by my power or my godliness that this happened? No, no, this happened by faith. You see, miracles are not random events, Amen. right? In Christianity, well, you just never know when God's going to move. <laughs> but that is not biblical thinking. It may be religious or Christian or doctrinal theological thinking, but it is not biblical thinking. That is not what God said. Jesus never walked in and was like, well, I wonder if God's going to move today. Come on, preach. Jesus... Jesus didn't perform miracles random. They were not random. They were on purpose. He spoke, Lazarus, come forth, and I'll come a dead man out of the grave. It happened because he wanted it to happen and because he spoke, because your faith will speak. Yes. The leper came to Jesus like, if you're willing, you can make me clean. She's like, I am willing. Be clean. Amen. Boom, clean. Healed. Done. Yeah. Right? These were not random occurrences of God just saying, well, he just, you never know. And it's, that's not, he spoke what was in him and it came out of him and made a difference. If we're waiting for a random God, it's not going to happen. God is waiting for us to speak by faith so he can do what he's already done. Amen. That's a man applaud. He's getting it right there. Come on, applaud. Praise God. It's not random, but it's on purpose. And he says this when he says faith. This man was healed by faith in the name of Jesus. This is what Jesus is always saying. It's almost like Peter is kind of going back to that mo those moments when he was with Christ. And he was like, and Jesus kept saying, man, if you just have a little faith, just believe God. Have faith in God. Speak to the mountain. Peter's like, can you increase our faith? And Jesus is like, man, you just need faith as small as a mustard seed. That's all you need. Just, can you just give me a little faith? Just this much faith. And it's like Peter was like, ding, 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 ding. It's just by faith. Right? I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It wasn't my goodness that did this. The only thing separating you from your miracle is faith. And I mean you. See, Jesus would walk up people, he'd be like, your faith made you whole. What was he doing? He was like, I need you to do this. You have the spirit of God within you. This is the kind of church that's going to tell you, put your hand on your own body and speak to it in the name of Jesus because you got the power. You don't have to come up here. I want you to come up here and get your miracle. I do, but you don't have to. Jesus is like, I don't want to just give you some fish. I want to teach you yes. how to fish. Yes. You can have this authority. I was praying over a woman in India in 2004. We got 10,000 people there. And we got down after the service. We'd already done the prayer of salvation. And I got down. I said, we're going to pray for some of you. We, so the whole band got down in the crowd. And people were pressing in on us. And there was a woman. She came up and they led her up there. She was old. And, and she, was, she had white on her eyes. You could, you could just see the calluses or what do they call them? Cataracts or whatever on her eyes. And, she, and, and the translator said to me, this woman wants you to pray for her sight. And she, did, she wasn't always blind. This is new that's been happening to her. And so, and so I prayed for her. I said, in the name of Jesus, see, right? I spoke to it and I told it what to do. Now, 
and I spoke to it with authority, but I want you to listen to me for a second. People were pressing in and I felt pretty vulnerable and I was like, what's going on? And I don't know, I'm down here and I'm thinking about all the things that are going, my head was not in the game. This is my point. My head wasn't in the game. I spoke the right words, but my head was not in the game yet. I, in fact, I probably would have had to keep speaking it to get myself stirred up to, to, to get it going. Do you, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, yes. And, and, but I, my head wasn't in the game yet. And, and, but then I saw something, I stepped back because I saw something fall out of her eyes. And then she starts jumping around, she could see. And I, and I realized that my head was not in the game, but hers was. And I said, your faith, right? I got it. In that moment, I got it. I was like, your faith did this. Do you see that? And so Jesus is trying to get us stirred up for miracle faith that we can do in our world and in our life. And he says to us, the only thing separating you from your miracle is faith. And that's a big one. It's tough. It's taken Peter a lot of years to kind of get where he is. Let's be honest. But he's there now. And so I want you to know that his revelation can be our revelation today. We can skip a couple years ahead by recognizing what he just said. It's just your faith that separates you from the miracle. That's it. It's not your occupation that separates you from the miracle. It's not your genetics that separates you from the miracle. It's not your pedigree. It's not your, well, my grandpa had it and my dad had it. So I have it. And that separate, that doesn't separate you from miracle. Satan cannot separate you from your miracle. Come on, somebody. It's not going to be how many degrees you have on your wall, how many certificates of theology and studying of the Bible that you did that's going to separate you from your miracle. It's just faith. It really is that simple. Come on. It really is that simple. Praise the Lord Jesus. And so... You know that Peter wasn't always Mr. Perfect. In his uh, school of Jesus, he was not a straight-A student. Peter, when he started and Jesus found him out at the docks and he was fishing, along his path with Jesus, he made a lot of mistakes. He was just a normal guy who didn't get it all right. We might think, well, he's Peter. Sometimes I look at stories of Jesus, Pastor Mary, can I just talk to you for a second? I'll look at stories of Jesus, and I'm just being human now for you. I'm just being transparent with you. And I'll see, well, Jesus healed this blind boy or something, or he healed this group of lepers, and I think, yeah, but he's Jesus. Do you ever do that? You're like, well, yeah, he's, but he's Jesus. Like, I'm not Jesus. But you are because you have that spirit in it. But there is this thing in us that goes, yeah, but he's Jesus. Like, he never did anything wrong. Like, I did some stuff wrong. But Peter, now Peter I can identify with a little bit. Right? Peter's working in some miracles now, and I'm like, but I'm, I, I, could be, I, I, could, I could be Peter. I could be like Peter. Right. I start thinking about Peter. Like, Jesus, he's on the boat, and Jesus is like walking on the water, and Peter's kind of showing off a little bit. He's like, I want to walk on the water. And Peter's like, and Jesus is like, well, why don't you come on out? And so, and so Peter gets out of the boat, and he's walking on the water, but then he sees the winds and the waves, and what does he do? He falls in, and he cries out, Lord, save me. Right? And so Jesus reaches down, picks him up. But what does Jesus say to him? Oh, you of little faith. The man who just showed some great faith started out with just some little faith. Amen. Right? The Messiah just said, oh, you of little faith. This is the same Peter who was among the disciples that during the storm, they all said, we're going to die. And they went and woke Jesus up. Save us. And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. There was a demon-possessed boy that the disciples couldn't cast the devil out of him. And the father came to Jesus and said, your disciples have not been able to help my little boy. And Jesus turned to his disciples and Peter was among them. Oh, you of little faith. Peter wasn't always getting it right, was he? He was not always Mr. Perfect. Jesus goes up on the transfiguration mountain. He's transformed into glory, light. Moses and Elijah appear on the mountain. And you know what Peter does? He falls asleep. Peter. I guess he was all petered out. You know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> just needed a hot cup of Pete's coffee. Just Pete's, Pete's coffee. Just, no? Okay. I'll leave that one out next service. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus turns around and says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Look, you never want the Messiah calling you the devil. He got an F that day. Let's just say it. He's making some mistakes along the way. He's got some little faith. He's, he's putting his foot in his mouth. And then 
the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus says to Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus is about to go through the worst day, crucifixion, worst day of his life, best day of our lives, right? And, and he says to his disciples, he says, my soul is in such anguish to the point of death. Can you keep watch with me for a little while? Now, if your friend said that to you, what do you do? You keep watch. You stand with your friend. He's the Messiah. He's your teacher. He just asked you to do something. You're, he's, under, he's over you. He's in charge of you. But what does Peter do? He falls asleep. Jesus comes back. Couldn't you just stay awake and keep watch for one hour? Jesus is being arrested. Peter strikes the high priest's servant with a sword and cuts off his ear. And Jesus is like, ah! Puts the ear back on the guy and heals him. And looks at Peter. He's like, for Pete's sake! <laughs> Pete's sake. I'll leave that one out, too. Then Peter, while Jesus is in his darkest hour, denies even knowing him three times. What are we not supposed to do? What did Jesus say? If you deny me before man, I will deny you before my father. And we're not supposed to deny him. Yes. Praise God that Jesus restores repent, through repentance. We can receive forgiveness and mercy because Peter denied him. Look, people all over the world, even today, at the risk of death, will not deny their Christ. But Peter, the guy that Jesus used to plant his church, his first church, denied him not once, not twice, but three times. The third time, the guy was like, hey, you cut, I recognize you, you cut off my buddy's ear. Peter's like, it wasn't me. I never knew the man. In his darkest hour, then Peter goes and locks himself up in a room after the resurrection because he's afraid of the Jews. This is the same guy who just now walked out in public after hearing a guy presented the gospel of Jesus Christ and they threw him in prison for it. That's what's just about, that's what just happened right here. The guy who was so afraid that he not locked himself up, not once, but twice Jesus visited him behind a locked door for fear of the Jews. Then Peter went fishing and, and you might think, well, he just went fishing for the day. He was supposed to be starting the church, but he went fishing. And Jesus had to come visit him and get him back on target and go, do you love the fish more than me? This is that guy that just performed this merit. That's why he's able to go, do you think that it was by my own godliness that I did this? Like, he got it now. He got it that it was faith. And so then I ask you, if, you, if you've ever failed in prayer, you were standing for something and you thought you were believing God, but you fell in the water and you had to cry out to God for help. If that's ever been you, Peter says, it's all right, you're in good company. I failed too. Did you ever miss the miracle? If you've ever denied Christ, you walked away. When it seemed like he needed you the most, you ignored your calling, if that's ever been you. If you've ever missed the kingdom of God and you fell asleep at the wheel in your Christianity, if that's ever been you, if you've ever denied Christ when you shouldn't have, if you've ever done that, Peter would look at you today and he would point at you and he would say, you're in good company. I did those things too. And praise the living God by his mercy, he was able to use me to perform great miracles. Because it's not about your works and about what you've done, but it's about your faith in the name of Jesus Christ and the faith that comes through him. Come on, church. It ain't about you. It ain't about what you did. It's about what Jesus did. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 12, he really shows us this, that, that this idea that he's realized it's not about me. When Peter saw this, he said to them, here's his revelation. Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or our own godliness we had made this man walk? It's not by your power, your God. You don't have to be afraid about praying for something and stand and believing God for a miracle that if you fail, it's somehow your fault. It's not up to your power. It's just simply about your faith. It really is 
that simple. It's not up to your own godliness. It's so often that Satan comes to us and says, oh, who do you think you are? Oh, now you're going you're gonna to stand and pray for people, but your life's a shambles. Look at you. Right? Isn't that what he wants to do? Oh, now you're going to pray and believe God for a miracle, but look at your mess. You don't deserve a miracle. That's what Satan tries to do. He tries to make it about our godliness. Why? Because he doesn't want to see God's power moving on this planet. He doesn't want to see you believing in the name of Jesus. He doesn't want to hear the words, hey, Satan, this isn't about me, but it's about who Christ is on the inside of me. And he made me holy. And it's by his works. Come on, somebody. It's by his authority that I speak it all. Praise God. Wow. And so he says to the man, get up and walk. Let's look at it again in verse 6. Peter said, silver and gold, I do not have. What I do have, I give you. Do you got something? We got to give it away. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man, he reaches down, he picks him up, and the man does walk. You see, it was just not too long ago that, Jesus, that Peter was the one who needed to be saved. He was the one falling in the water saying, Lord, save me. He was the recipient of the save. And now he's become the giver of the salvation. Right? He was the one who needed help. And just a short time later, by faith in Jesus, he's able to give help. Do you see the difference? He was the recipient of the miracle. Now he's there being the resource or the tool used by Christ to produce the miracle. Listen to how faith sounds when it talks. You see, faith will speak, and when it speaks, it sounds different. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankles, bones received their strength. He said this, ergon parapetue, which is the exact same phrase Jesus used when he raised up the man who had been lowered through the ceiling, and he was on a mat. He used the exact same phrase that Jesus used. Ergon peripatue, peripateo. Sorry, I knew I was pronouncing it wrong. And so, what's he doing? He's imitating Christ. He's like, I've seen this movie. I've seen this movie. I know how this works. I've seen Jesus do it. Let me imitate Jesus, let me follow the pattern. And as his faith spoke, it sounds, see, a faith prayer sounds different. It didn't sound like one of my prayers that I used to pray that would be so fervent 10, 15 years ago before I saw this revelation. My prayer sounded like, oh, Father God, I just pray right now that if you can heal this man and give him strength, that, Lord, you would just heal and give strength to those legs. If he can? If he can just? This is how I sound, and I'm just being honest with you guys because as I'm saying this, some of us are like, oh, this is making me uncomfortable. This Prayer sounds a lot different than my prayers used to. Well, I'm just standing for the Lord to move. That sounds awesome, and I, I, I'm thankful that you're standing for the Lord to move. But that's just not how Peter prayed. Amen. That's not how faith sounds. Faith sounds different. In the Greek, there's a verbal form called the imperative, and it means there's an exclamation point on that word. It means it's a very bold word and it's a command. In this context, it was used as a command. Now, every miracle I can find from Jesus speaking to Peter speaking in these three that we're going we're gonna to hit the next two in a second is used in that verbal imperative form, whether it's the second errorist or the indicative, it's always the verbal imperative. Now, the imperative is a command with an exclamation point. It means this, he didn't go, hey, do you mind, could you just get up for a second? <laughs> but he made a demand. Amen. He said, get up and walk. Yeah. 
He told, he's told, he talked to the problem and he told the problem what to do. I'd write that down. I'd like get out a piece of paper, like talk to the problem and tell the problem what to do. I'd put it in my phone right now. I'd be like, talk to the problem and tell the problem what you want it to do. If the problem with the hand won't open, what do you tell the hand? Oh, Lord Jesus, if you could just heal that hand to give it the strength to open. No, no, no. You talk to the problem and you tell it what to do. Amen. Open! In the name of Jesus, I command you. There's a man, it was, it was, his neck was hurt and he couldn't move his, neck, he couldn't move his head. And so what do I, how do I pray for that? Oh, Father God, that you might send your ministering angels to come down here. And if you could just touch this man, if he could, he already did. If he could. So what do I say? I pray for a second. I'm like, Jesus, you're Lord. You're awesome. You're the name above all names. I stir myself up. I kind of think, Jesus, you are. I love saying Jesus is Lord. It always brings his presence, right? Jesus, you're Lord. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You've got the name above every name. This man is forgiven. He's righteous. He's holy. Washed in the blood of Jesus. And then I go, in Jesus' name, move your head. Amen. What did I do? I spoke to the problem and I told it what to do. Yes. I can't move my head. Well, then move it. Could you do that before? No. Praise God, you're healed. Amen. We gotta change how we pray. We talk to it. So my wife, she was, uh, she, she was complaining about a hearing problem. She said that she, her ears were ringing. This was last like October. And, and sometimes when we hear a problem comes our way, where you're gonna have an allergy, or your back hurts, or my knee hurts, I've been having an ankle problem, my wrist has been bothering me, I have a, a throat issue, it's been sore for a, a couple of weeks, I got the flu, I'm starting to feel the flu coming on. We find these things that are little weeds in our front yard, they come along and Satan delivers just little things that you could totally live with. You're like, it's not that bad. I talked to a woman once, and she was like, my, my back, my back hurts. And I was like, you want me to pray for that? She's like, no, it's not that bad. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what she said. She goes, it's not that bad. Well, how bad does it have to get before we pray? <laughs> I'm serious. We take all these things from Satan. We're like, well, that's not that bad. I can live with that. I'll just take a pill for that. I'll just take and we start taking all these things, and we stop speaking by faith the miracle-moving power of God over the little stuff. And then when the big stuff comes, we're surprised. <laughs> take the little stuff now. Get it. Yes. Exercise that faith. Talk to it. Praise God. And so, uh, so we went to the doctor, and the doctor, it was six months before we went to the doctor. Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we, we just live with it? It was my fault. It was my fault. And so we go to the doctor, but the, what does the doctor say? We take all these tests, and they put stuff in her ear, and they're x raying things, and then they go, well, they have to sit down. I never want to sit down with the doctor, ever. Can you sit down for a second? We don't want to sit down. <laughs> What your wife has what we call permanent hearing loss. We snickered because of the amount of times in our family we've heard permanent allergies, permanent asthma for Katie, permanent, all this permanent stuff they always speak over our kids. Your son, Logan, will permanently be, have all kinds of sick problems and liver problems. They spoke all this stuff over him when he was born. All the permanent things have all gone away and been healed, including the hearing, praise God. We just laugh because faith speaks. Sometimes faith laughs. It's like pff, permanent. <laughs> Thanks. You just fired me up, lady. That's all you did. You just stirred the fire. <laughs> but it speaks. Faith sounds different. It desires to have a voice. And when it comes out, it sounds different. And so Acts chapter 9 and verse 34, Peter comes across a crippled man. It says, and he said to him this, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Right? I love how he says this. Arise and make your bed. Now, the phrasing he used sounds a lot like when Jesus said to the lame man, arise and take your mat. It's almost identical, except for he went to this guy's house. So this is where he lives. So he can't take his bed somewhere. He needs to leave it there. That's where it goes. So it's almost like Jesus, Peter was like, I've seen this movie. All I have to do is say, arise and make your bed. <laughs> like, you can't take it because it belongs here, but make it. Get that pillow in the right spot, too. That's not where that goes. And then, but look how he talks to it. He talked to it, and he told it what to do. 
and he demanded it. We, we went, me, my, it's my anniversary the other day, and uh, well, it's actually coming up, but we went to a hotel. We've been married for 23 years, praise God. She's still with me, she's still tolerating me. And, uh, and we went to a, a, a hotel, and I, I, want, I reserved a king non-smoking. Okay, so, I, so we got to the room, and it was a, two queen beds. I was like, no, we do a king. Like, we sleep in the same bed. We're, we had abstinence before marriage, but now that we're married, right, we've succumbed to temptation. Let's just say that. We sleep in the same bed now. And so, so I showed the lady. I said, no, no, we got a king non-smoking. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. We gave all the king's non-smokings away. We just have two queens. Now, how many know I didn't just go, okay. But I went, mm, see here, I already paid for this room. I already paid for it. And this is an email from you saying I have a king non-smoking. So give me my king non-smoking. Well, we can't, but you have to because I already paid for it. What's my point? You see, you got to make a demand and then you can't take no for an answer because Jesus already paid for it. He already paid for it. The bill's been paid. It's your room. It's a king non-smoking. You take your room. How many know I didn't just walk away? Well, you're going to have to get somebody else that can get me a king non-smoking because I already paid for it. And I made my demand until they went and got someone else. And the other guy came out and he's like, well, you did already pay for it. Tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give you a room that's about three times the size, yes. king non-smoking for the same price. <laughs> Praise God when it comes to your healing. You see, Peter didn't take no for an answer. He grabbed that man and he lifted him up. Rise and get up. Walk. Grab him. Come on. He acted on it, right? He didn't just talk to it. He demanded it and wouldn't take no for an answer. But he pulled him up. Praise God. Peter raises the dead in, in verse 41. He goes into a room and it says, uh, this woman had died and uh, they were all weeping in the room and making a bunch of noise. In verse 40, it says, but Peter put them all out. That sounds exactly like what Jesus did with Jairus' daughter when he said, Talitha Kumi, and raised her from the dead. He put them all out, and he knelt down and prayed, right? He stirred himself up. He's like, oh, we're going to war. And then he did this. And turning to the body, he said, and he's just following Jesus. He talked to the problem, and he told it what to do. Tabitha was her name. Tabitha! Arise. Now, he said it in the name of Jesus, but he didn't even use the name of Jesus here. But we know he said it in the name of Jesus. He was using the authority Jesus gave him. Do you see that? Tabitha, arise. Jesus said, Talitha, arise. There's only one letter difference. He was following a pattern. He's like, I've seen this movie before. I've seen Jesus do this. I'm just going to do it the way Jesus does it. Somebody say amen. amen. So also with us. So also with us. We as well can speak by faith, make demands, and see miracles happen. And I want this for you in your life. This is something that Kelly and I have been living in our family for many years, that we as a family have experienced many times from knees to shin bones to you just, the amount of miracles the Lord has performed in our lives because of this simple truth. Speak to it and tell it what to do. And I'll be honest with you, there's sometimes I speak to it and tell it what to do, and it just doesn't do jack. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I give up. So I fell in the water. Okay, but we keep trying. Just because it doesn't work every time doesn't mean we give up and quit. You just keep talking to it. Just keep talking to it. Just don't give up. Keep talking to it. Keep talking to it. Praise the Lord Jesus. Father God, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for this word. I ask the Lord that you'd bless us in our hearts, that you'd create revelation inside of us, that it might bring life to us in every area of our lives. We might be able to operate in this miracle faith that comes from you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Praise God. I'm glad you guys tuned in and watched. I hope you enjoyed today. And uh, we always encourage you, if you want to connect to us, send us your prayer requests. We really do pray over these things. Send us your praise reports. We'd love to share all the miracles that God's doing in your life. Uh, one way you can knit our hearts together is through your giving. You plant some seed in this ministry. I know that God will reward you. He gives seed to the sower anyways. And it, it kind of partners us together. 
in this cause of preaching this gospel. This minister to you, I just encourage you, sow a little seed back into this ministry. I appreciate you guys. God bless you. Thanks for watching.